Welcome to the show, IB Nation Sports Talk. We're up and running. Glad to have you with us here today. It is Double Styers with Jesse Styers. I am Sean Styers. How are you today, Jesse? Um, I'm doing good. It's a fast Monday, which is always good uh, when your team is playing on Monday night. I thought today was going to go slow, uh, but today actually went really fast. Work went by really good. Got a nice flow in work, and everything just kind of flew by. So it's a great day. I have people coming over for the game tonight, so I've been preparing wings and all kinds of food throughout the day as well. So busy day over in the in the household over here. Yes, that is exactly right. And uh, you got your Cowboys sweatshirt on, I see. I had my Cowboys gear on. It got a little warm, though, so I took it off before the show started. And I just want to address this right away. Salty Virginia Peanuts is getting salty right away. It's Russian roulette. Will Sean's computer work or not? The anticipation builds. I just want to say. It's not all my computer. There are a multitude of issues. And as you know, every time Jesse is sitting at the other end, I tell him it's always something. It's it can be a microphone, it can be a computer, it can be the internet, it can be a co-host's ear earbuds for that matter. There are a multitude of different things. But tonight, knock on wood, things are smooth so far. Um RJ Irving, we're gonna we're, we're gonna talk about the uh, the targeting rule in rapid fire. So uh, hold your horses on that. We're gonna get to JD Bertrand and his targeting and and the whole thing coming up in a little bit. Glad to have you with us though today, man. Two wins in a row, and now we're smoking it into a bye week as we get ready for this thing. Notre Dame two and two going into the bye week after the forty five thirty two win over North Carolina. Uh, before we go any further, the token. Smash that like button for us if you would. Subscribe, rate, review, comment, all that great stuff. Will I get to as many comments as always as we can? And I just got to say, boo to Michael Hahn, who says go Giants. No way. <laughs> Come on. Interesting, though. I, I was thinking about this after the game. Looking at the total yardage and the score, the last two years... Notre Dame wins 45 to 32 Saturday, 943 yards of total offense. Last year, Notre Dame wins 44 to 34, 1,087 yards of total offense. So a difference of one total point and 144 yards the last two years. Kind of crazy, I thought. Yeah, those those final outcomes kind of really similar. And I didn't even notice that until you kind of brought it up. Um, but yeah, very similar games, but it, it felt like this a lot more uh, lopsided or one-sided. There was just a couple plays, in my opinion, you know, outside of that first drive uh, that North Carolina scored on, and then another one kind of midway through the second quarter. I thought the defense played great. You know, I know some big plays were given up, but, you know, I, I really thought that the, this game was much more lopsided than that final score indicated. Um. We were talking on countdown to kickoff Saturday. Would there be over 900 total yards in the game? I didn't think there would be. And it was because I, you know, I obviously wasn't convinced Notre Dame could contribute that many yards. And it turns out Notre Dame is the one that churned out all the yards, 567 of them, or 576 rather, to 367 for North Carolina. 214 of North Carolina's yards came on Four plays, of course, the two biggest ones, the 80-yard pass play for a touchdown, the 64-yard pass play for a touchdown to Antoine Green, who was in on both of those. So uh, I guess I'll start with this. Just what impressed you the most in Notre Dame's victory Saturday? Uh, I think the thing that impressed me the most was that we saw them perform well across all three phases. We didn't see uh, a lot of, you know, uh, bright spots here and then down spots there, bright spots here, down spots there. You know, in every game, is there things that you could work on and get better at? Of course. 
but it felt like in all three phases, Notre Dame won the game. It was nice seeing them get uh, some quality punt returns. I know it wasn't a lot, but Brandon Joseph taking those punts five, 10 yards, that's very helpful for, you know, an offense, the, the farther you can get away from your own territory. So Absolutely. I think the thing that I liked the most or the thing that I was most impressed with is that we saw success in not one phase, but across all three phases and at a high level at that. It wasn't just, you know, mediocrity. This was kind of success and, and phase success that we saw last year and this, you know, over, I, not even last year, you know, coming into this season and kind of the things that we expected at the beginning of this season. So I would say I was most impressed with just the team unity and team success that they had this week. Yeah. Uh, one for Vigo, he says, I know you're watching Dahmer on Netflix, bro. My wife has been trying to get me. She's been kind of hinting at that. And I'm like, yeah, I don't even know. I don't know. Dahmer, do I really want to watch that? So we're, we're shying away from that. We've actually got some Hulu shows we've been watching lately but and, and i haven't watched the uh the new season of cobra kai i i kind of my interest started to dip a little bit last season so i'm holding on out on that one as well and then irish gordian knot says um <laughs> i guess it was not irish gordian knot he was oh it was irish gordon uh, he says every time i see jesse all i think is how similar it is to the collinsworths can you say nepotism well you know maybe you can but uh Jesse's not getting quite the bankroll that Jack is getting for uh, for his job, and I'm not getting quite the bankroll that Chris is getting for his either, for that matter. But we're doing we're doing well. We're having a good time talking a little football with you today. Is all I, you know. I was I was impressed with the offense the most, and I mean you can look at all phases of the offense, whether it was Drew Pine, who we'll talk about more specifically here in a minute, and the passing game, the running game, the offensive line. You know, the receivers, there's still a little bit more, but and we're going to get into Tommy Reese's play calling as well, but the offensive line where it is right now compared to where it was a month ago is night and day. And obviously, the level of the team that they played is different, but still, to, to go out there to manhandle North Carolina, I mean, you should have been able to manhandle Marshall the same way you manhandled North Carolina. And they've gotten better each of these last two weeks. And, you know, again, I wasn't expecting over 570 yards of offense, and they were able to uh, to generate both 289 passing and rushing the ball, exactly 289 of each. So it's it, it was a very impressive overall day. Started with the offensive line, but bled right into Drew Pine as well, who was 24 of 34, 289 yards. Completed 71% of his passes and three touchdowns. And Jess, I don't think watching him, you know, again, this is why I, I just was not, not just him, but so many different reasons why I was so uneasy about trying to pick this game. I did ultimately pick Notre Dame to win, but I had him scoring 31 points. I had it 31 to 28. They ended up scoring, what, two more touchdowns than what I had uh, projected. North Carolina only got four more points than what I had for them. And, you know, again, this was an offensive juggernaut that North Carolina brought coming in, but it was Notre Dame that had the best offense out there on the field Saturday. Are you frozen up? Uh oh. <laughs> are, are you back in? I'm got, back. I don't know. I don't know what happened. It says I have great connection, and then all of a sudden my screen was spinning, so I just backed out and got in as soon as I could. I, See? I just wanted this to eliminate is, all problems. This is what happens. And I forgot at the end of the show the other day, I did have my internet went out. You know, right at the end. Oh well. So I was just talking about Drew Pine and and the offense. Never would have thought that we would see that kind of offensive day. What'd you think of what you saw from Drew Pine Saturday? You know, I thought Drew Pine stepped up to the table and did what he was supposed to. I, I, I was, you know, completely – you talked about kind of your score prediction um, and where you saw things going. I saw Notre Dame winning this game um, and it going under, you know, whatever – I think it was like 55 points because, in my opinion, I thought if Notre Dame was going to win this game that they would have to limit North Carolina offensively uh, and, and do enough offensively themselves to, to score, and there was no indication – that, you know, from the prior three games that Notre Dame would have this much success throwing and passing and just overall dominance on, on offense like this and, you know, rack up the yards and points like they did. So 
Drew Pine far exceeded my expectations. And I thought that he did a, a magnificent job of, you know, using plays to build off of each other. You know, a lot of that credit goes to Tommy Reese, I think, and the play calling and the play design. Uh, but to be able to execute the plays and find the reads the way that he was, I thought that Drew Pine played a masterful game. Um, and most importantly, he didn't throw any any interceptions. And that, that, that's a big you know, important thing that he has to continue to do going forward. Uh, and especially again against teams like North Carolina, where offensive possessions are so important, you can't be giving away possessions. And I thought he did a great job of protecting the ball, uh, finding the right read and doing what he was asked to do. He did his job this week. And that was exactly what Tommy Reese just wanted him to do is his job. Yeah. And it showed, you know, the offense flowed. Granted, North Carolina's defense is not uh, as good as some of the defenses that Notre Dame will see. Uh, but he just did his job. Yeah, no bobbled snaps, no mental errors. He eliminated all that. I think the worst thing, the only critique that I would have on Drew Pine this week is he's got to eliminate those uh, those passes getting knocked down at the line of scrimmage. In that first drive, yeah. he had two passes knocked down. I mean, that's just a product of staring at his read and the defensive lineman just being able to simply time it because he stares at him the whole time and he lets the ball go. So there's no, you know, it's easy for the defensive lineman to, to get that kind of jump on the ball. And we all know he's relatively short compared to, you know, most, most standard quarterbacks. So you got to do things like that where you can't waste plays. You know, you can't have your balls getting batted down to the line of scrimmage, but I thought Drew Pine played fantastic. He put the ball where he needed to. He put a lot of, you know, a lot of balls right on target where only his wide receivers could catch him. I didn't see any passes necessarily behind people. So I was really impressed with Drew Pine this week. And I mean, think about that. You know, the fact that on that first drive, he has two, two passes batted down at the line of scrimmage by defensive lineman. He only had eight other incompletions the rest of the day in 34 attempts. You know, he'd be up there close to 74, 75% if he completes those two, they did get him out of the pocket. They were a bit vanilla. The first couple drives, you know, like we're going to talk about some of the imagination of the offense. We didn't see that on those first two drives, but I thought pine, he showed he could make his layups. Like we talked about last week, more importantly, if you're going to pack the box and try to stop Notre Dame's run game, Drew Pine showed that he's got enough to beat you deep. You know, we, we, yeah. So we, well, we know that it happened anyway, the deep post to Lorenzo styles. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, you know, and some deeper balls as well. He showed that he can do that. And an underrated play that I felt like had nothing to do with this throwing it's third and eight deep in Notre Dame territory on the third drive of the game. They've already, you know, punted and missed a field goal the first couple drives. And so it's third and eight. North Carolina blitzes. Pine is surrounded back there in the pocket. He doesn't panic, though. He spins out of trouble. He ends up scrambling. I don't know if you remember this. Over to his right toward the sideline. He gets just enough for the first down. Again, after he was just swarmed in the backfield. And they go on to score, you know, that touchdown pass to Michael Mayer. So I thought he showed, you know, pretty good presence, didn't panic or, you know, some of that stuff. Like there were times where, where sometimes you see a quarterback will just bite the dust, you know, when he's under that kind of pressure and, and just go down and, and not want to be hit. But he got out of it, kept the drive alive, you know, kept the play alive, kept the drive alive. And they go on to score the first of 24 consecutive points, 24 points in the second quarter that they had. And, of course, on top of what Drew Pine gave them, three Irish running backs, top 100 yards from scrimmage. It's the first time it's happened, according to Notre Dame's football PR teams, since at least 1996. Estime, 134 yards all on the ground, two touchdowns, 7.9 per carry. Logan Diggs, 115 total yards, 50 on the ground, 65 through the air. Uh, he had, a, of course, a touchdown catch in Chris Tyree with, a, with 104 total yards. Tyree and Estime both topped 100 last week as well. So you've you've had basically five backs do it in the last two games, which is very impressive. Notre Dame had 80 total plays. Those three totaled 99 snaps. So that is 19 times where you had 21 personnel out there. What do you think first about how Reese, Tommy Reese used those three? I thought it was a master class session. We talked about last week in order for this offense to work, in order to get Drew Pine going, what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to get the run game going. They're going to have to establish that and then build off of those was kind of short little plays to your running backs, even if you're not running the ball or using them as disguise. And I think that that was done perfectly. 
I think Estime is the perfect, you know, all of these backs do different things uh, compared to the other. Some are better than, at, you know, one than this. Some are better than one at that. But altogether, they can all run the ball effectively and they can all pat, catch the ball effectively. So that's very hard for teams because you can't lock in on one guy and say, OK, in a, in a two personnel, meaning two running backs are going to be on the field. We can lock in on this guy saying, OK, he can only run the ball and he can only catch the ball. And, and so that puts a lot more pressure um, on the defense. And when you have three three running backs who all had over 100 combined yards in some way, um, it, it's going to be hard on defenses going forward and, you know and that's why Notre Dame has to utilize some of this two personnel more so is because who is going to stop you know this three-headed running back monster where you have two running backs on the field and you combine that with probably the best tight end in the country or at least if you ask Dan Orlovsky who the best tight end in the country is and who this offense runs through um but you know when you combine running backs like that you combine the offensive line that they have you combine Michael Mayer, it's going to be very hard to stop this offense if they can do this consistently. So I think that getting these running backs going is the most important part uh, of this offense, whether they're running the ball or catching the ball, this offense goes through the running back production. If these running backs don't have good production, I think the rest of the offense doesn't have production. So getting those guys going the way that, you know, all three of these guys were intertwined into the offense estimate had 38 snaps. Uh, Tyree had 39 snaps. That's the perfect balance between those two. When you can bring in a guy like Audric Estime and be your finisher, you know, he was punishing safeties. I don't know if you saw, but when he finished his runs, oh, yeah. he's, he's not going around guys. He is he was punishing, looking for guys to hit. That's he is right. Punishing safeties. And I tell you what, if one time, the first time a safety makes that tackle, he is not going to want to do that again. So I love the way that they use these running backs. Um, and I thought it was just a very good display by, by, uh, Tommy Reese. Drew Pine and, and company on offense. And after seeing them the previous week against Cal, seeing Tyree and Estime, how they were able to use them with no Logan Diggs in the game, I was pretty skeptical about, do you, do you really need to get Diggs involved? You know, how much do you really need to get him out there? I think Logan Diggs, you know, he can catch the ball as a blocker. That's his biggest thing. I think right now is he is he being hesitant because he doesn't want to throw that surgically repaired shoulder into somebody. That's kind of how he looked in the first two games of the season. But I think that if you're able to put them out, put him out there with another running back, you get to see some of the mismatches that you know that they can cause out there. Is that you? Is that me? What where is that coming from? Hang on, I'm I'm listening. I'm only hearing that when when my headphones are in. So yeah, I think me that's too. On your side. <laughs> well, but but it went away as soon as you uh, as soon as you took them out. <sighs> I think it might be our downstairs neighbor's fire alarm. Okay. So I apologize for for anyone that has to hear that beep noise. That's all right. That's all right. Well, well, I mean. I hope your building's not on fire. It would just be par for the course with everything else that's going on <laughs> though right now. Um, but, okay, so the touchdown pass to Logan Diggs. Let's start with that. You know, like if you're going to talk about how these guys can complement each other, you've got Chris Tyree in the slot to the left. You've got Michael Mayer and Braden Lindsay also over there. So you've got three of them split out there to a left, a tight end, a wide receiver, and a running back. You've got Diggs in the backfield. And so... They bring Tyree in motion from the left slot across the backfield. And he, you know, so now he's moving to the right. They also pulled Jared Patterson, Jared Patterson, the left guard to the right side. So you've got, you show the flow of the play going that way. Drew Pine rolls in that direction. Diggs is in the backfield. He leaks out back to the left where that formation started out there with those three receivers the tight end the the running back and the receiver Mayer and Lindsay both run post plays and clear that whole thing out pine rolls to the right boom Every, you know Diggs, of course is wide open over there on the left it was just a thing of beauty the way they were able to move North Carolina's defense around and again it all started off when you've got Mayer and Tyree over there together with Lindsay on the left and then you motion Tyree, one of those two running backs, it, it just, you know, it, it was, uh, it was, it was drawn up pretty well. 
Yeah, I think the number one thing that you have to realize is when Notre Dame goes 22 personnel like that and Diggs and Tyree are on this field at the same time, two explosive backs who can catch the ball, Mayer who can catch the ball. This is what exactly what we talked about last week and kind of one of Notre Dame's keys to the game is they needed to manipulate those linebackers. So how do you manipulate linebackers? You get your running backs and your your big you know All-American tight end on linebackers one-on-one. So what did we see? Michael Mayer's first touchdown, he caught a flood route, flood route over the middle, five-yard flood, matched one-on-one with a linebacker. We saw Diggs catch the pass that you're talking about because he had a one-on-one matchup with the linebacker. When you go 22 personnel and you create these matchups, that's why these running backs have so, so much success is because they are better on the field together. They complement each other. It puts more stress on the defense. And so you create a lot of favorable one-on-one matchups by doing that kind of stuff. And then you get guys in motion, you get the defense confused even more, right? Pre snap things. You have guys, you have Patterson pulling out. So then, okay, linebackers are reading run. And then you flip back, you know, and just flip a little pass opposite field. That's exactly what, you know, Tommy Reese was trying to accomplish in his play calling. And that's, like I said, these are kind of the things that we talked about last week is how can they create, you know, these short kind of routes and get their, their guys lined up one-on-one with linebackers. Well, that's exactly what they did. So, you know, going 22 personnel like that is so effective because you're going to get, you know, one of those guys has to end up probably being matched up one-on-one with the linebacker. And another thing is when you have three running backs like that, you can interchange them. So those guys are staying fresh. You right. know, a defense that's out there consistently is going to have to go against freshly rotated backs. So I think that's another big advantage that Notre Dame has when they go 22 percent on having three running backs like this. So here's Drew Pine after the game. Talked with the media was was asked about that play specifically and also Tommy Reese's play calling. Here's what Pine had to say about it all. Well, you know, I think Coach Reese called an unbelievable game. Um, he puts me in a position to go out there and just succeed and, and do my job and execute. And I mean, almost, I can't tell you how many times I went over to and ran over the phone and said, Coach Reese, that was all you. Like, that, you know, that's, I mean, he just puts us in such good positions to succeed. And, um, you know, the drive starters, he, again, he just puts us in a position to succeed. So that's all, you know, Coach Reese and the guys playing hard. And, um, you know, it's pretty good having three backs that can do everything. Um, so I'm very, very thankful for all those guys. The, well, the first play uh, during the, it was a drive out, drive starter. We were going into the tunnel where we ran out and it was a, it was a naked and I threw it out of bounds. And no one went with a running back, and we noticed it. And uh, yeah, you know, so, so the next time, Diggs was, no one was around him, and uh, you know, it's it's a pretty awesome feeling. You know, except that ball feels like it's in the air for 20 seconds. <laughs> um, but you know, just again, a credit to Coach Reese. He called an unbelievable game and put us in a great position to succeed. Yeah, I mean, Coach he's saying it's been. Well, there you go, and you know, he you know, he talks about how they basically set it up with, with you know what they end up with that throwback to Logan Diggs there on that wheel out of the backfield. It's funny because I remember in live time, I think I texted you and said, wow, the wheel is there. (laughs) You know, this is what we talked about. And then I, you know, I don't know how many plays later, obviously they noticed the same thing and boom, it's still open. No one accounted for him. Easy play. Uh, But like, like, like uh, Pine was saying, Tommy Reese, I feel like is doing his most, his best effort to take the pressure off of Pine uh, as, as most as possible, right? Like, how can I simplify this for, for Drew as much as possible? How can I get creative to get our playmakers the ball in space and let them be playmakers? And that's the main thing that I think Tommy Reese is doing is just getting his playmakers uh, the ball in space and saying, okay, I trust you to be better uh, than, than the playmakers on the defense. And yeah. that really showed. And I, I really have to, you know, you have to tip your cap to Tommy Reese. Is, he's gone under some scrutiny the, the, the first couple of weeks. Uh, the offense hasn't looked quite how, you know, we thought things were, you know, is that, is that because of Tommy Reese? Is that because of play calling? Is that because of play design? I don't know, but things seem to sync up this week. I think that's the biggest takeaway that I saw offensively is things just look synced up. Everyone looked like they knew what they were supposed to be doing, whether it be the offensive line, the running backs, Drew Pine, um, the wide receivers, everyone just knew what they were doing. Everyone was in sync. There was good flow. There was good pace. There was good tempo. Everything was executed at a very high level offensively this week. And I think that has been our biggest concern and the thing that we've been wanting to see the most of. And so that just a real quick, and I'm going to get back to Drew Pine here in a, in a second from a, 
a comment, couple comments that Brian had. But um, first play of the second quarter, you've got both Diggs and Tyree again in the backfield. And again, talking about using this two back stuff. So you've got shotgun formation with Pine, and you've got running backs to his left and to his right. You know, it's really you don't see a whole lot of this anymore. It's been a while since you see it. the Green Bay Packers actually did some of this yesterday believe it or not, in that game against the Buccaneers. But so they motion digs to the right. They play fake to Chris Tyree going to the left. And then he ends up hitting digs on a wheel route on that 40-yard gain on the right. Now, they had also drug Lorenzo Styles out into the flat to freeze the defender. Right. And then, you know, again, they get Pine out of the pocket. You know, so again, like this is some of that stuff you were talking about last week, you know, like where where you can do some of the th same things that you were, you know, like, how are they going to get vertical? All these different things. Well, you're manipulating different defenders around with all this different movement. And again, when you've got personnel matchups that are favorable to you, whether it's Mayer or you know these, these running backs, the ability to do all this stuff, because when they brought out Styles into the flat, there's that defensive back sitting there and he's in no man's land. He's like, do I go with Diggs or do I jump on Styles? Because right. one of them is going to be wide open, whoever I don't pick. And of course, he kind of, you know, he stayed frozen there. And then Diggs kept running, and, and Pine was just able to hit him easy money on that game. Yeah. And I think the most important thing that you, you said there, and kind of what we were talking about last week as well, is you have to show kind of similar concept and play motion that you've been showing before, because then that's what the defense recognizes. And then you leak something in behind them. And that's exactly what that wheel route was is they showed that exact same, you know, kind of play motion where they're rolling uh pine out to the right and Lindsay's coming into the flat, you know, across the field into the flat from the, from left to right. And it looks like they're just going to dump that ball down just like they've been doing over and over again. Well, then you put that defender in a bind and all of a sudden the running backs leaking up the sideline, like we talked yeah. about and he's boom, it's wide open. It's just building off of your base plays, your fundamental concepts. And that's exactly what Tommy Reese did this play or this week, honestly. And, I, I mean, myself was kind of surprised because I said, okay, when is, when is Tommy going to pull it out? Because it, it, you don't want to get too soon. You don't want to be too late, but he just said, I'm going to put all my cards on the table this week. And you're hoping that he builds off of it week by week. You don't want to show yeah. the same things, but you want to have your base, your fundamental plays where, okay, that Lindsay play, you, you do flip it down there into the flat and gain only three or four yards and get a second and six, which is much more manageable. And you continuously show that action. And then, okay, well, then what? Then they bite on it. Uh, you know, they they well, consistently show that they're going to bite on it, and you're leaking in those kind of plays uh, behind them. But, and again, they ran the same formation a little bit later. They motion digs in the same direction, you know, the same side to the right, just like they had hit him on that what turned into a 40 yard pass play. So they take when they did that, two players, two defenders go out of the box with digs to the right. Well, guess what happens? <laughs> they hand the ball off to Chris Tyree, who bangs it up for, for 20 yards because, again, Patterson is pulling on that play, and he sets up a block. He just practically, you know, he could have just killed a defensive back if he wanted to on that play. But, again, they use the same thing. Motion digs the same way, and they just run it to digs instead, and he gains 20 yards on it. Just the ability to, you know, to line up, do some very simple things, but you've got a lot of different options that you can go out of this. Isn't that the beautiful thing? Imagine being a defense and having to prepare for three plays inside of one play. Because that's essentially what Notre Dame is doing now with that concept is they can run it, you, you know, with the Patterson pulling, they can they can flip that ball down into the flat to Lindsay like they have been, or they can sneak in this kind of concept wheel route and hit that. So this is just putting so much more stress on the defense. And that's that's exactly what Tommy Reese needs to do kind of with this offense and, and, the, and the personnel that he has. Yeah. So Brian NY um, said after Marshall and the Cal start, the bar for Pine was unreasonably low, unrealistically low. Would have been impossible here for him not to exceed expectations. I was not surprised. He's a good quarterback. He's a better passer <laughs> than Book. I will say he is. He's will. He's he's definitely more willing than Book to to let his playmakers go get the ball. He's maybe, less robotic. Especially for early on. Yeah, like, you know, Ian Book was unwilling to throw very many contested passes, as we all saw for three years. Now, it was great in the fact that he didn't turn the ball over, but we all know how frustrating it could be at times. But 
Drew Pine is much more willing to do that. He knows if you've got a guy like Michael Mayer and you just throw the ball up, Michael Mayer is going to beat people out there for the football. And we saw that time and time again. So his willingness to do that, you know, is really good. Now, as far as the, you know, the expectations were unrealistically low, this is not a knock on Drew Pine, but he set the bar for himself unrealistically low with his own play, you know, the way he started with the interception that he had against Marshall and then with the horrible start against Cal. Now, since the uh, do your effing job, uh, you know, from Tommy Reese, he has been a much different quarterback. You know, like if you look at 10 for or, or 24 for 34 and then 10 for 11, that's what 34 for 45 for pretty close to 400 yards, you know, roughly. And uh, what, like five touchdown passes, I think it is, since that happened. He's been he's been a different quarterback. So, you know, yeah, the, mar the bar might have started low, but it started low because that's where he said it himself with the way that he played in those two games. Absolutely. So, 289 passing yards, 289 rushing yards, and 5.6 per carry. And that's the big one to me, the 5.6 per carry. Just one false start. Which of those three do you like the best? Uh, in my opinion, the 289 rushing yards is the most important stat there because without establishing that run game, I don't think that the passing game flows or operates as well as it does. You know, we kind of talked about it just, just previously. Is they Notre Dame's a lot of their concepts are built in where it could be a run concept or a pass concept. And the only way the pass concepts work, or not even, you know, within concept to concept is the only way a lot of these passing plays work is if you establish the run game and you make the make the defense uh, respect the run first. And that was shown on the on the post route that uh, that Lorenzo Styles scored on because I don't know if you remember, but it was a long drawn out kind of you know outside run fake to Estime. It put the safety in a bind. He takes just two step two steps forward. Styles gets past him to you know two steps past him and it. You know, obviously, we didn't see, get to see it in live time. Uh, but, you know, after <laughs> it took us five minutes break, to get to see it. Yeah, because it put the cameraman off. in a bind. That's right. <laughs> right. So that only happens. That touchdown to Styles only happens because they established the run game and they made those linebackers and safeties, you know, take a step up and then things just got past them. So to me, the most impressive part and the part that I think is the most crucial is the 289 rushing yards. Yeah, I do too, because it, it it sets everything else up, you know, their ability to do everything else. And BYU is going to be a better football team than North Carolina. We've got a couple of weeks, obviously, for that one. But they were pushed around by Oregon a couple of weeks ago. And I, so I was a little surprised like that. So I think that that is a game where Notre Dame, you know, can potentially out-physical the Cougars as well. It's still going to be a tough game, but I think this is a great start to get them going because now – they go into this bye week. They can self-scout, work on themselves for a week this week in practice before they get into BYU prep next week. We saw some great improvements. I agree with the rushing thing, but I like the false starts. You know, the, the false starts, the lack of false starts important as well because, again, they didn't put themselves into binds by, you know, putting themselves back behind the chains in third and long situations just by stupid stuff. And what's crazy is, all these false starts, all the false starts happened in two home games. We 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 didn't see them that much against Ohio State, and we saw just one against North Carolina. So it's weird that you see all these false starts at home and not in the road games. Yeah, and like you said, the, the false starts are very, are very important because you want your offense to stay on schedule as much as possible, right? You don't want any first and 15s or you don't want a, a big play to be negated just by a false start. So staying on schedule is the most important part. Uh, so I think that that is another crucial aspect of, if I had to go pecking order, I'd say one rushing yards, two penalties, and then three, the passing yards that kind of came off of it. But like you said, it's so important that this offense stays into rhythm. They can't face any setbacks, uh, it, setbacks that they can control. You know, sometimes you can't, you have to tip your cap to the defense making a good play, but you have to control the things that you can control, and that's penalties. So, you know, no no legal formations, no false starts, none of the simple penalties that you can control. So I thought that that was, again, very important because it made them stay on schedule. It, you know, it allowed Tommy Reese to kind of stay in that flow of how he wanted to call the game. 
And if you look now as we flip to the other side of the ball, the reason, again, you can't ask for more balance than exactly 289 of each rushing and passing. Now, obviously, they took some knees you know, at the end that, that took away from the rushing yards. Otherwise, they would have had a little bit more. But still, they were very balanced. They were not one-dimensional. And when you look at how Notre Dame shut down North Carolina, they were passing for 310 a game. They were rushing for over 230 yards per game. Carolina went into the game as the number four scoring offense in the country, averaging 51.3 a game, held to 32, could easily have been half of that, if not for the four big plays that we talked about. Number seven in third down conversions, 56% they were converting, held to six of 14, that's just 42%. And Drake May, the quarterback, number six completion percentage in the country at 74%, just 53%. They drove right down the field, you know, scored right away, 12 plays, 76 yards, and May ripped off a 12-yard run on third and nine. It keeps the drive going. On that first drive alone, he accounted for 33 yards on the ground. They ended up with, what, 67 rushing yards in the game. They punted on four of their last five drives of the first half. Going into the second half, you know, they punted again five times and a fumble as Notre Dame scored those 24 straight points. but. They made Carolina one-dimensional. That was the big thing. 66 rushing yards it was on 28 carries for a team that was averaging 237 a game. And again, they got half of that rushing yards on the first drive from the quarterback. So, Mr. Defensive Guru, how did the Irish do it defensively? You know, what we were talking about last week is that North Carolina was predominantly going to come out in the same personnel no matter pass or run. It was 11 personnel. And whether they use that H back on the line of scrimmage or if they split them out wide, that was going to kind of be the big thing. I think what Notre Dame did is like exactly what you said. They made North Carolina one dimensional and they put them in very second or very long second downs and third downs by eliminating those run plays early on. And so Mm -hmm. in an offense that has to move the ball, you know, obviously all offense has to move the ball, but North Carolina (laughs) wants to get, basically what Notre Dame did is what North Carolina wanted to do. They wanted to run the ball and get, you know, second and six, second and seven, second and five, and and have the option to run it there or pass it there. But Notre Dame took away that option by eliminating the run early. And the only run success that they had is what you were talking about. And that was with May. And that kind of, you know, figured its way out when Maris decided, okay, I think I'm actually going to have to be a quarterback spy today rather than just kind of do whatever I want. And that was a big emphasis that I thought, you know, is North Carolina couldn't get bailed out of second and third and longs by letting May just kind of, you know, evade the pocket and get these first downs. And after that first drive, Notre Dame did a really good job of limiting May and eliminating, you know, eliminating his ability to run the run with his feet and taking away uh, the run game uh, early in, in, in early on in possessions or early on in, in the, the drive series. Um, and that was really done with Notre Dame's defensive line just kind of overwhelming the offensive line. You know, I, we knew it wasn't going to be as great of a group offensive line wise for North Carolina, but they just physically dominated and got into their holes uh, when they were supposed to. And on those run schemes, you know, they're not overly power run schemes. So these linebackers can just fill their gaps as fast as possible without, you know, as soon as they see run and not have to worry about getting penalized by not seeing a puller and I think North Carolina essentially made it easier on Notre Dame's linebackers this week to recognize run and to get into their holes because when you're not running like I said when you're not running a lot of power pull schemes or you know guard tackle pullers and you're just kind of you know letting your linemen block off the snap and just handing it off these linebackers are essentially just responsible for a gap so as long as they as soon as they see run they're just going to fill their gap as soon as possible, and these runs are going to be stuffed up. So getting North Carolina to be one-dimensional, having to pass you know, second and long, third and long, really made it easy for Notre Dame. They blew up a lot of North Carolina's you know, tunnel screens, any sort of screen, short passes that may want to accomplish, they blew those up. So any you know, short, short passes or run games, Notre Dame took away from them and put them in second and third and longs, and that made it extremely hard for May. I felt like they did a good job of, you know, again, this is a guy who was only making his fourth career start, Drake May. It, they they did a good job of disguising coverages, it seemed like, you know, making him think it was going to be man and then zone and, and vice versa, doing some of those kind of things. It's interesting what you were saying about 
you know, the run lanes and the run fills, because I did feel like the linebackers, you know, had much better run fits than we saw through the first three games. But you're, 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 you're kind of saying that it was just because it was uh, maybe it was a lot easier. easier based on Carolina's they scheme didn't have than anything. to think as much as a linebacker. And I don't, you know, I'm not trying to take away from their performance, but that's what it was. They didn't have to think about as much when you don't have pullers going and you see the running back just handed the ball, you just play football and go tackle the guy that has the ball. And that's exactly yeah. what Notre Dame did. They just overwhelmed this offensive line once they noticed that it was going to be run. Like, if you don't have a puller pulling, you're just sitting there waiting for them to hand the ball off, and then you just go get whoever has the ball. And that's really what their linebackers did. And in the times when May started to run, you know, he got burned a little bit. but Then they got smart and just put Maris on him as a spy. And I thought that was a beautiful move. There was a play – Maris made an absolutely beautiful play where he lined up on the, the, the there were three down linemen. He lined up like he was going to come snap of the ball. He takes a step back. It's going to be a QB draw. It's third. And I think long, he, he evades two uh, North Carolina defense or offensive linemen very easily and tackles may for like a two yard gain, you know, just stuff like that. I thought, I thought may, uh, yeah, he was rattled once, once he was off his game. He, you know, he wants to one, two, three, boom, get the ball out. Well, Notre Dame took away those reads early, and he was in second and long. And so you're forcing him to go downfield. You're taking away his primary read. He was just off schedule all night. And so Notre Dame did just a great job of probably executing what their game plan was. You had to, you know, you had to think that that was the game plan. A limit, you know, get make them go into long down long down situations, take away their run game, and make May beat us with kind of some more intermediate passes rather than these short little passes that he likes to get off. Yeah. Foskey and Mills both had really good games. And again, you know, like, especially when you're going up against this kind of offense where the quarterback does want to get it out in rhythm so quickly, I felt like they had really good games. Foskey, five tackles, half a sack and a tackle for loss. And Riley Mills, five tackles, a couple sacks, two and a half tackles for loss. I think those two guys stood out. I was impressed with the linebacker play, but you know, again, like you make me think a little bit more. I mean, at least they did their job, I guess. No, you still but, have to execute and do your job, yeah. but at the same time, if your job's a little bit easier, you're going to have probably a little bit more success compared to usual. Yep, for sure. For sure. All right, so an all-around performance as Notre Dame improves to 2 and 2 going into this bye week. Of course, We'll be here all week, every day. Vince will be in the next couple of days. Jesse will be back on uh, Thursday. Brian is going to have the uh, Countdown to Kickoff show. I'm not sure who's going to be with him this week. Of course, there won't be a postgame show this week. But uh, we keep on potting every day, every day. Brian and Ryan and uh, Sean Davis did a recruiting podcast earlier today. I, you know, I know they talked about a lot of different stuff there as well. But you know where we are right now, Jesse? It has to be rapid fire. It is rapid fire time. <laughs> so now we're going to lead with this. Here's what Drew Tranquil t- tweeted about the targeting call on J.D. Bertrand. This is from Drew Tranquil, Irish alum, of course, Los Angeles Charger. That's a horrible call on J.D. Bertrand. The targeting penalty is well-intentioned, but to eject someone for playing great technique is a shame. Great middle read technique by JD. So Jesse, do you buy that or do you sell it? I mean, you're asking a very biased question here. So <laughs> I'm a hundred. I'm asking a linebacker a question, a former linebacker that question. So yeah, I I know and uh, biasy aside though, all jokes aside, I I completely buy uh, what Tranquil is saying. And I thought in live time, I thought J- JD Bertrand was just how do you do that? You know, it's just your first playback or maybe even first series back. I can't necessarily remember. Um, but as soon as he comes in, he's put into a tough, spe- a tough, like, like he would like the, the technique that Tranquil was describing. That's a hard play because he's got to cover him and then make, you know, make the tackle. And I thought that the tackle was led with face mask into the shoulder. I thought it was a clean hit. It only looks dramatic because he, he, you're, you're, May threw that to his guy up the seam, knowing he's going to take a lick. Like that, that is a play where your guy is going to take a lick almost instantly of catching the ball. So I thought the technique was good. Orlowski pointed out a good point. That's like a six foot two Bertrand compared to a six foot six, you know, bigger body. I can't remember if it was tight end or wide receiver, but he was a tight end. It, it, according to their official 
listed heights. Bertrand is 6'1. Nesbitt, Bryson Nesbitt is six foot five. So you're still talking about four inches difference right there. And I think that's a factor as well. Right. And he didn't he didn't lead with the crown of his helmet. His face mask struck the defender in his shoulder pads. It was not in the neck. It was not in the head. It was not. It, it was a beautiful football play. I thought that, you know, he made the coverage. He made the tackle and he did what he was supposed to. And it only looks dramatic because of what we were talking about. That, that whoever is catching the ball in that play design is going to get hit hard no matter what, and it's going to catch them off guard. They're not yeah. going to be prepared for the hit. And so, unfortunately for J.D. Bertrand, it was just, you know, any other linebacker that makes that play, they're doing what they're supposed to, um, but he just didn't lead with the crown, in my opinion. He didn't, you know, try to, what's the word, uh, like spearhead you know there was no launch with the header head i thought it was face mask right into the shoulder pads just a natural football play so and that's exactly it that's exactly it and again when you start with the fact that bertrand is four inches shorter than the guy you know just naturally you know there's there's going to be your your tackle is going to be at a different level when the guy is you know kind of bent over like that Bertrand hit, and I, and I watched this play, I don't know how many times, probably at least 20 times today, stopping it, freezing it, backing it up, stopping it, freezing it, and then listening to Dan Orlovsky's commentary in there as well and what he had to say about it. And he agrees with what we're saying. Bertrand hits Nesbitt with his face mask first on Nesbitt's right shoulder. Again, Mr. Former middle linebacker, what do they teach you when you're tackling? What's Eyes to the sky? The first thing you want to strike with is your face mask to the yes. chest. Yes, see what you hit, right? See what you hit. That is always what they say, and that is exactly what Bertrand does. His face mask plows into Nesbitt's right shoulder. See what you hit, and Bertrand literally sees it when he hits the face mask on Nesbitt's shoulder. That's the first contact. It wasn't like there, and there's there's no disputing it. Was there some incidental contact between the top of his helmet and like the, you know, like the bottom of Nesbitt's, you know, kind of face mask area? Yeah, but that was after the initial comment or contact and Nesbitt's head kind of jostles a little bit because of the impact of the hit. The first contact is there and Orlovsky's going, oh, that's an awful call. He did not lead with the crown of his helmet. And that's what it's supposed to be. He's not launching himself up into his head. He didn't hit anything with the crown of his helmet. Any contact that was made by Bertrand's helmet to Nesbitt came after that first contact was made. You know, again, when he comes up a little bit because he's he's in the process of making a tackle, you know. So someone on Twitter, you know, was coming after me talking about how Bertrand hasn't played well this year and all this different stuff. That may be true, but that does not negate the fact that that was a bad call by the officials. J.D. Bertrand has not played as well so far this year as he did last year. Now, he made a couple plays in, in that game specifically against North Carolina. His overall play has not been what it was last year, but that has nothing to do with this specific play. The only question is, was it targeting or was it not? It, you know, how he's played has nothing to do with that call and how anyone should feel about that call. So there is a new rule this year. The, uh, the NCAA changed the rule on targeting this year and it looks like <laughs> looks like jesse's internet has uh been uh, are, are you still with me right now i don't know what's going on i my neighbors are driving me crazy they're setting off smoke alarms they're, oh, they're awesome. doing stuff with all the wi-fi today so cool i don't cool. know what's going on but it's, yeah so it's a very so, frustrating evening right now so we're transitioning into there is a new rule this year that the ncaa instituted that allows teams to appeal targeting calls that happen in the second half of games. So in other words, you know, Notre Dame, if they want, could appeal to the NCAA that this should not have been called targeting. Now, Marcus Freeman, after the game in the immediate, you know, in the press conference said it was targeting. There's no question. And he's basically went to, we've got to teach JD, you know, how to tackle better. And all I didn't stuff. like that. No, I didn't either. And especially without the benefit, you know, what do coaches always say? I've got to see the film because watching it live, if all you did was watch it live, then you can make, you know, you can make a snap judgment for what you think it's going to be, but you need to see that frame by frame, which is what they're supposed to do when they're looking in the booth to determine, was it actually targeting 
or was it not? I can't believe they upheld it. But my question to you is, would you appeal this call if you're Notre Dame? I don't understand why you wouldn't appeal. The worst thing that they can say is no, and you're already in a no situation. So why not get have the opportunity of getting a yes? There's no consequence to appealing. It's not like his uh, his suspension would get like added on or you know anything like that. There's no reper- repercussions, in my opinion, to appealing. And like you said, I just can't believe that they went to the booth and still determined that this was targeting. Um, and so. And again, another point is if I'm Marcus Freeman, I understand, you know, you want to say, oh, we got to teach our players better, but you haven't seen the hit. You know, you haven't, I, I'm more so why not protect your player until you've seen the hit and maybe right. come out and say on Monday at your, you know, weekly press conference that we've gone through it. We've talked with JD. We need to, you know, he needs to figure out a way. We need to teach him a way to strike better, but to come out and say automatically that it was targeting and not really defend your player and not really show that you have maybe the inkling to to appeal it was really off-putting for me and kind of an off-putting situation. One of the only off-putting situations that I can think of that I've kind of experienced with Marcus Freeman so far. Yeah. I was, I was surprised that, that he was, you know, I guess that definitive with his response to it again, because coaches always want to say, well, I got to go back and look at the film again. If all you're doing is watching it live as it happens and you're, you're watching it from across the field, you know, and like on the targeting, now I wasn't in the stadium, so I can't say for sure what they showed, but they typically don't show that kind of stuff, you know, up on the Jumbotron, you know, like the, the targeting reviews and, and stuff like that. But if you're watching it live, it looks worse than it actually was because, again, Bertrand is four inches shorter than Nesbitt, which makes it look like Bertrand maybe is – you know, like just his trajectory is going upwards, but he's not really going upwards. He's going into him. It's just that he's four inches shorter than him, you know, so it it looks a little bit different. But if you slow it down and watch it again, what actually happened, which they would do in an appeal, you can see there is no actual targeting because he didn't go helmet to helmet by any means. The first contact is with Bertrand's face mask to the shoulder, and then you get some incidental grazing afterwards. So I would ab- absolutely appeal if I am Notre Dame. I'm curious to see if they do. We won't potentially be able to find that out until next week, but uh, I will be really curious to see if they do appeal that that targeting because now you're, you know, again, you were already without JG JD Bertrand in the first half of North Carolina. He comes back in, immediately makes impact, stripping the ball away from May and forcing that fumble. And then you had a big play right there. So I would absolutely, I would absolutely appeal this since that is a new possibility this year. Fill in the blank, Jess. ABC's broadcast of the Notre Dame Carolina game was blank. Uh, The broadcast itself was great. Uh, The production, not as great. I thought we're talking, we're, yeah, we're talking about the, the overall, we're talking about it all, baby. Ah, so in, in those terms, I wouldn't say great. I would say subpar. It reminded me a lot of the Ohio State uh, game. Not, you know, not not great camera work, not, you know, knowing where to be at the right times. I thought Orlovsky uh, was really good. I enjoyed listening to him throughout the game. Did he have a couple of things wrong here and there? Yeah, but I mean, he's it's it's a tough job to kind of, you know, prepare for a college team like that completely in one week. I thought he did a very good job, you know, given the situation. Um, but yeah, overall, the the whole package, it was underwhelming. And if it for someone, you know, a, a, a product like Notre Dame, and I'm not just saying this as a fan, I'm saying the product of Notre Dame, knowing how many viewers you're going to get, I think that you can do better. Um, and they need to do better knowing, you know, what kind of viewership they're going to get because Notre Dame is playing. I'm going to go back in just a second. Salty has a question about that, you know, the appeal process. And I'll get to that here in a second, but to this, I mean, start with the Lorenzo styles touchdown pass. They were completely fooled because, you know, they lock in on the play fake to estimate you've got styles running a, a a post, you get a touchdown only. We don't see the touchdown pass for almost five minutes. We don't even get a replay. They started to show the replay, but they go and show them kicking the extra point instead. So then we go to commercial break. We come back, Again, it takes almost five minutes to get to see that. So, I mean, the production there was horrible. 
he called Harry he stand Harry high stand once, <laughs> which was you know it reminded me of the first game of the season when Fowler and Herb Street were talking about a Harry he stand, and they are now uh, obviously. Herb Street and Fowler don't have any control over the, you know, the director and, and the cameras and all that stuff. But then they're zooming in on somebody on the sideline that is supposed to be Harry Heastand, but it was not Harry Heastand. And, you know, so there, there were just like both times we've seen ABC, it has been really sloppy so far, you know, along the lines with the production and the direction of the game. It has been really bad. I like Orlovsky's technical knowledge. You know, I, I like his ability to explain why things happen. That kind of thing. He called Maris Leofau the impact player of the game early. Talked about his tremendous nat natural instincts. We saw more of that, I think, than we've seen this this year in the game. You know, again, maybe part of that's because North Carolina's offense was so simple. But still, he talked about Michael Mayer as being the most complete tight end in the nation because of his willingness to block. You know, and then you know after and then after the. Remember the timeout that Marcus Freeman took with 28 seconds left in the half? And, you know, there, there was all this, you know, what were they going to go for it? Are they going to kick it? He predicted that, that Freeman was going to kick it after taking the timeout. So I thought that was was good. Bob was choosing. Not bad, you know. he's But I, I think or, Orlovsky really elevates that broadcast. I think the one knock on him would be the fact that he spends all week talking about the NFL and then he has to go outside right. that to prepare for college games on the weekend. So that, I think that hurts him a little bit because there were, you know, some more details that maybe he's not as up on as he needs to be specific about the team. But that's what's going to happen when you're talking about the NFL all week and you're calling college games on the weekend. My quick rapid fire back to you. Do you think in that very first North Carolina possession where they get down there and they line up for field goal and then Freeman – calls timeout because he's like, ah, something's fishy here. Do you think if Freeman doesn't call that timeout, Carolina just kicks that ball and, and then it's over with, or does Freeman calling that timeout cause a touchdown? Because I think Freeman overthought it, calls the timeout, and then they said, okay, well, thanks. We're going to second think, you know, you're going to burn a timeout. We're going to second think this and right. get a good play out there. And we're going to, and they ended up scoring. So I think that that's a, uh, some inexperience as a coach. Me personally, I think that timeout led to North Carolina's touchdown. I think it very well may have, I, you know, I think that, you know, for the, for the most part, you know, again, like there was another time where Freeman takes a timeout and, it, you know, I think that he's got Mac Brown kind of guessing and stuff like that. What are they going to do? You know, all this kind of like there, there was a little bit of chess, but I think in that instance, you're probably right. I think Carolina probably would have just kicked the field goal if Freeman hadn't called the timeout. That's what I thought. I just thought it was something interesting that wasn't really talked about. That's all. yeah. Yeah. So Salty asks, can Bertrand's targeting suspension for the first half of BYU be lifted by appealing to the NCAA or when officials review Saturday's call? Yes. So if you appeal to the NCAA and the NCAA backs your appeal or, you know, reverses the call, then they would essentially, this is why you you are able to, in a, you can't appeal a first half targeting because obviously if it's a first half targeting, you're just ejected for the, you know, for the second half of that game. But if it happens in the second half, then you've got a week in a Notre Dame's case, obviously two weeks, but you've got a week until your next game, you can appeal to the NCAA. And then if, if they, you know, agree, you know, and, and reverse the call, then Bertrand's uh, suspension for the first half of BYU would be lifted. If the NCAA were to rule in Notre Dame's favor, if they appeal that that's again, that's a new rule this year that they just instituted where you can do that. Uh, Tyler Evans has a uh, super chat for us today. And I was saving that for, uh, for rapid fire. What do you think of these coaches getting fired mid season or early season with huge buyouts? Uh, I think this might be in reference. Cause the only thing that I saw this week was <laughs> Herm Edwards getting the boot on the field well, after the Arizona state game. I don't know if there was any other ones you could probably fill me in. Um, on some of those the Georgia Tech head coach just got fired and of course Herm Edwards got fired last week on the then, field yeah <laughs> well he didn't get fired on the field but the president in the AD said we're going to meet with you tomorrow and then he got the boot basically but it's he never was on good a plane when you're the next day yeah 
Yeah. So, you know, so Herm Edwards and of course, Scott Frost did as well. We talked about Scott Frost after it happened. And basically, if Nebraska had waited until October 1st, instead of paying a $15 million buyout, they would have only paid seven and a half million. And what I don't get, I don't get, I don't get firing coaches in September. It it makes no sense at all because you don't get a leg up. You know, it's, everyone else is still going through their seasons. You can't be interviewing other coach, you know, coaches while the season is going on Doesn't and all you're going to do in and, and like, you know, like the question said, yeah. I mean, the only, the only thing that it can do, I guess, is benefit recruiting, but even then it adds uncertainty because you don't know who the coaching staff is going to be. But like in the Scott Frost thing, it made absolutely no sense when, when the, like if, if, if you're going to fire a coach in week two or three, because I guess they played in zero weeks. So, yeah, technically it was like after week two, their third game. But still, if you're going to fire a coach that sh- soon, you should have fired him last year. Because obviously you didn't have faith in him if, you know, if you're going to make that kind of decision this soon. And you just end up paying more as well. It's just a, it's just a poorly run organization is what it comes down to when you're, when you're making those kind of decisions this early in the season. So I think it's stupid to fire a coach in September. You should have fired him at the end of the last season if if you're willing to pull the trigger this soon. Yeah, I'm I'm almost in complete agreement with what you're saying there. It's it to me, you already came into the season with a short leash, um, and you knew that. So why didn't you make the decision, you know, beforehand? Was was three games really going to sway your opinion? Like what it, it, what what would it take? You know, there's obviously this expectation list coming into a season that you have for these coaches, if you're not going to fire him, but you're willing to fire him for, you know, four games into uh, the season. I'm not a fan of it. I think that, you know, if you're going to fire someone, I think it should be in the second half of the season after they've proven kind of at least a half a resume that, you know, that that this isn't going the the way that you thought. And you just kind of want to get a head start, you know, on that next kind of coaching carousel. Uh, But right now, all that's going to happen is some sort of, you know, assistant's going to become the uh, interim head coach. You're not going to find a, a, a head coach in the, you know, this early in the season like that. So I've never understood it. I think it's just overall, there's no advantage into firing a coach this early. Um, Unless you, it'd be one thing, I guess, here's the only circumstance in which I could see it. If you have a grossly overrated team, like say for some reason, Alabama started the season like, oh, and four and they, and they can save it and then go on to go eight and four. Well, then there's a clear and obvious distinction that it was the head coach, but I think that there's very few and far between cases where that's actually the case. Yes. Yes. Fill in the blank. It was blank that ABC was cutting into the Clemson Wake Forest game with a live split screen during Aaron Judge's home run chase Saturday. It was so stupid and distracting. I I remember texting someone at some point. I said, who effing cares about Aaron Judge? This is football. If I wanted to watch the baseball game, I would have flipped on the baseball game, you know, like I'm as the viewer making the decision that I want to watch football and I don't want to constantly be going back and forth between this Aaron judge situation when Clemson and Wake Forest is going to double overtime. You know, it's just, it's not, it's not what I signed up for. If I wanted to watch (laughs) that, I would put it on. I would buy a split screen TV picture in picture and put them both on. I'd buy a second TV and have it going in the background, something but when I'm dedicated to watching football, I don't want this Aaron Judge thing popping up and overriding completely. It wasn't even like they were just putting on Aaron Judge's at bat. They were, you know, using the commentary instead, instead right. of the Wake Forest and Clemson game. So I thought overall it was very annoying um, and very distracting for what I wanted to be doing, and that's watching football. Yeah. And now before it went to overtime, they were doing this as well. And, you know, I started seeing people tweeting man they better not be doing this during the notre dame game and they decided not to once the notre dame game started but they were doing it still during wake and clemson you're right you know like the fact that they were doing a 50 50 split and then they've got you know kind of like what we've got on our youtube screen it's it's basically like that where you've got the two screens but they're not even like taking up the full screen that you know they had other graphics and stuff like that around it so it was so small and I actually did, you know, like they had the game on MLB Network and Bob Costas was calling it. So I'm like, I'm not going to watch it. I can't see anything on these two small screens. So I just flipped over for a minute to see what happened on MLB Network and then flip right back 
by the time the split screen was gone. But ninety nine percent of college football fans were just completely annoyed by it. If you wanted to watch Aaron Judge, which you know, I you know, like it's it's history. So again, I did actually flip over a couple times and then flip right back to the game. But if you wanted to watch Aaron Judge, go watch Aaron Judge. People who are watching Clemson and Wake Forest. 99% of them could not have cared less exactly. about what was going on with Aaron Judge. You know, at, at, if if anything, you could have, you know, just put a little scroll at, at the bottom, you know, if it actually happened, Aaron Judge does whatever. But I, I thought it was just completely off the mark by ABC to think that that the audience for that game was was cared that much about Aaron Judge trying to break the uh, the American League record, trying to get his 61st home run and it was just like you said not only did they do that but they put up i think it was it was the yes network it was the yankees yes network call rather than keeping the call of the football game on and just showing you the baseball and you could have at, at the very most you could have put it in a smaller box but I, I just i just thought the whole thing was was uncalled for they didn't need to do it at all and i think most people agree Okay, um, the Chiefs look like they had the Colts beat after a sack of Matt Ryan late in the fourth quarter yesterday. But Chris Jones, Chiefs defensive lineman, was flagged for unsportsmanlike <coughs> conduct for trash talking. Oh, he trash talked to Matt Ryan after the sack. It prolonged the drive because they threw a flag and it led to the Colts game winning touchdown. Is it fair or foul? For a professional football player to be flagged for trash talk like that, it's foul for a professional sports, or you know, really any professional athlete to be kind of flagged or teched up, or you know, whatever you want to call it for that kind of situation. I'll tell you why it happens every single play. Every single play, there is trash Somebody talk saying between That's right. one person on one side and one person on the other. So if, 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 here's what I'm going to say. If if you're going to call that on Chris Jones, then you better be calling that that penalty every time you hear guys trash talking. And you know what that's going to lead to? A flag on every single play because that yeah. happens every single play. You can't pick and choose when it's time to throw a flag on someone because they said an F-bomb to the other guy across the line of scrimmage. These are grown mid. They say it to each other every game. Indy Nation, a rule is a rule. Uh, but you can't pick and choose when you want to enforce the rule. This can't, you know, especially right. in the because most you can't tell me that situation. was the only time that happened. No, right. I get and it. You, you, you know, they've they got the targeting or not the target, the the taunting thing and all that. But it was like, come on, come on. It's like last year. Remember what game was that? Where some guy like made a gesture towards the other team's sideline and got an unsportsmanlike penalty, and that team right. ends up coming back to win. I just don't like when these kind of situations uh, overtake a game or allow another team to win, because that's essentially what happened. And I really don't care about what was said because yeah. like I said, there's it a lot of It doesn't matter what was said because you can't tell said. me that, that something wasn't said on the play before that. And probably the play after that by other people is, you know, in, in the entire course of the game, here's, here's why I really brought this one. I completely agree. These are grown men. They're getting paid millions of dollars. Who cares what they say? To each other who cares if they're tracking this is not college this is not high school and quite frankly i you know you've been out there on a high school field as well and i've <laughs> seen and heard you know other accounts of you know pretty bad stuff you know taking place on a high school field where where nothing was ever done you know in terms of unsportsmanlike conduct here's the real reason i brought it up though here's what really grinded my gears on this because again they get the sack. The Colts are going to have to punt because there's like five and a half minutes left or something like that. So there was still time. The Chiefs are up by four. They were minus three and a half in that game. And if the if if the point well, even even with the Colts, the bottom line is I had a parlay on this game. <laughs> I had the Chiefs, I had the Chiefs giving the points, and I had the under as well and they were sitting you know i had them at three and a half they were sitting with a four point lead at that point so if they had just forced the punt in all likelihood the best case scenario 
was was that the Colts, you know, were going to have to try some desperation play at the end of the game. But as it was, I lose my parlay because Chris Jones talked trash to uh, to Matt Ryan. After yeah, and that's another, you know, aspect that that's, you know, these refs aren't taking into account because they don't care. But there's a lot of, you know, money on the line with games now. You can't just <laughs> exactly be throwing right. flags to throw flags like these are game altering decisions and you can't just decide when you want to pick and choose to enforce them. Like if you're going to if you're going to do that, then I, as soon as someone says a bad word, the very first time of that game, you throw the flag and you keep doing it, you know, throughout the entire game. But you can't tell me that no bad words were said before that Chris Jones penalty. Right. Right. What would you think about the butt punt yesterday? <laughs> Dolphins Bills. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it which is worse uh garoppolo taking the dan orlowski safety or the punter kicking it into his butt like you pick which one you want i'm gonna go with the punter is worse because i can understand getting lost back there and kind of losing you know you're kind of uh just where you are but for a punter he does it every single week you practice punts backed up in your end zone like that there's no excuse i love the frame sh- the freeze frame shot of the football like forming around his butt and it looks like he's like the ball is literally <laughs> up his butt so yes <laughs> i thought it was it was hilarious don't get me wrong but at the same time it just can never happen i just flipped over on on the ticket and i'm not sure who the analyst was but he was saying you know should should the dolphins just take a safety here just run out of the back of the end zone rather than risk this punt and then what happens butt punt you know so it's like you you would have been better off just snapping it out of the back of the end zone and not even touching it you know because they were very fortunate that that ball didn't ricochet and get recovered by the bills in the end zone but it was it was a crazy play first time i've seen that and then like you said you had the orlovsky garoppolo play yesterday as well so it was just uh kind of one of those days just just uh a weird day in the nfl for that kind of stuff in an ugly game last night in that Sunday game that you were talking about. Uh, these, uh, these Sunday night games have been brutal. Like that game is Russell Wilson, even a good quarterback anymore, like one drive. And, and I can't remember who it was, but it's like, he's missing just easy passes. I don't, I don't know what's going on with him right now, but yeah, Sunday night football has not been fun so far. Yeah. Michael said, there's no way that's the correct formation. Why have a personal protector backed up? In the end zone. That is a good question because, I mean, there was barely, what, maybe four or five yards between them from where the personal protector was to, you know, to where the punter was lined up at the back of the end zone. It, it, it was, it was pretty tight back there. I'm not sure why you'd have that either. It's like you almost just need him standing, you know, between the guard and the center or something like that in that gap just to protect it. I don't know. LeBron James tweeted this over the weekend. Do I have college eligibility if I want if I went to play another sport besides basketball? How does that role work? Would you like to see LeBron play another sport in college, Jesse? No, I wouldn't like to see LeBron play another <laughs> college sport. It's college sports for a reason. Could he compete based off of pure athleticism? Sure. But, you know, these are college kids. They're chasing a dream uh, that they want. LeBron's lived his dream. He's still living his dream. He's going to continue to live his dream for a couple more years. Um, I think his ultimate dream is to play in the NBA with his sons. Um, Major coincidence that the NBA Players Association is now trying to get the rule changed where you can be, you can come into the NBA uh, straight from high school as LeBron's years are running out and his sons are approaching the NBA. I thought that was a funny segue, very coincidental. Um, I thought it was funny today that the Ohio State athletic director tweeted back at LeBron and said that, Basically, if you never pursued uh, a professional path in said sport, you can you have the eligibility left to play another sport. Meaning, yeah, like J.R. Smith. J.R. Smith is playing college golf, right? And so LeBron knew the answer to the question. It was just all a, a, a publicity stunt to get some attention, to get you know some attractiveness around his tweet. He's not an idiot. He his best friend is J.R. <laughs> Smith. You know, he knows these things. It was just to. Just, you know, I love LeBron, but at the same time, he just was, you know, floating one out there just to get people to respond and say, oh, we'd love to see you play football at Ohio State. You know, that's what he was looking for. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what he was looking for. Like, like he needs more 
love and attention thrown his way at this point. It would, you know, and, and where he is with his body right now. Like, I'd like to see him actually go, like, maybe go to Jackson State and play tight end for Deion Sanders or or something like that. You know, like if it was going to happen, go to a smaller, go to a, a, a smaller school, not Ohio State necessarily. I think that'd be a good matchup for them. Last question tonight, Jess. Fill in the blank. It's blank that Rihanna has been announced as the Super Bowl halftime featured musical act. Just so you know, you don't do it again. It's Rihanna. I, I heard it said both ways. I thought it was Rihanna, but I heard it on NFL Network all day as Rihanna. So. Well, all those NFL Network people are wrong. And yes. They influenced you to be wrong, but luckily you have a 26-year-old son that is always here to keep you <laughs> up and modern and hip. All right. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I think it's uh, I, I think it's great that Rihanna has been announced as a Super Bowl halftime uh, musical act. I think that uh, it, we've kind of seen this uh, – what should I say, kind of path recently of kind of, you know, similar art, artists that uh, are, are very similar, kind of have the same background, kind of hip hop, rappy, you know, a uh, person of influence at the halftime show. They must have been doing well. I think it's always great to see female artists out there, especially, you know, African-American female artists. I think it's great to have as much diversity um, as possible. And I think that she's going to nail it. She's going to put on a good show. She always does. It'd be kind of, you know, now, I'm not saying she's the same level as Beyonce, but you can expect the same kind of performance. You know, like it's going to be a great show overall. Um, I don't think that it, I think it's a step back maybe from, you know, like the Kendrick Lamar stuff that we've seen in the past. That might be a little bit too much for people. I definitely think that Rihanna is that kind of in between of, you know, kind of the all different genres of groups of people that you're trying to hit. I know you're not a huge fan of past Super Bowl shows. So that this is kind of a, a step down from that. It's a notch down from that. And I think that that's what the aim was with going with someone like Rihanna. It's more neutral. Yeah. It appeals to more people overall. Rihanna. Rihanna. <laughs> She's the umbrella Ella Ella singer. <laughs> there isn't we she? go. Yes. Yeah. I remember that one from, from way back. When. That's pretty much all I could tell you about her. I've never been a, you know, I wouldn't even say a fan, but they want to skew younger. I mean, the average age of an NFL viewer is skewing older. And I think that's why we saw, you know, like a, a hip hop type halftime performance last year. And that's why they're going with her this year, uh, you know, because, you know, let's let's be honest. They've already recycled <laughs> a lot of the uh, the people in in my demographic. You know, they've been through. A lot of them from the Stones to Springsteen and, and on and on and on. So they're skewing younger right now. Prince Prince was Prince was an all-timer, I thought. Prince was uh was great, but I just there's really nobody I think in that league right now that, that would appeal to uh you know to a large audience. So I'll be curious to see who they end up getting, you know, as kind of the side acts along with her, because there's always somebody besides just the main performer. Yeah, then that's the other thing is like they announced Rihanna, but there's going to be other parts to it, right? Like when have we – when was the last time we saw like a full solo act at the halftime yeah. uh, of the Super Bowl? But speaking of NFL, I think we need to bring up that Irish shytown town question. Uh, he, he just threw it out there, threw me up a lob. I'm going to have to – going to have to give this one a, a quick response before we, before we sign off Cowboys tonight. Prediction for Giants tonight. 23 to 13 Irish shy town. That's going to be the final score. Uh, CD lamb is going to grab his first touchdown. Ezekiel Elliott is going to grab a touchdown tonight on the ground, throw all those together in a parlay, put $5 on it, win yourself some money tonight. And then thank me <laughs> next time you see me. Dan, Danny dimes. I think he's going to have a tough, tough time with number 11. Out yeah. There. There's, Micah there's, Parsons. That, that guy, Micah Parsons is, you know, making it very hard. Uh, for for some opposing defenses, and let's just say that the Giants will not be one of three remaining undefeated teams by by the time that this night is over. I hope not. I hope not. You know, I'd feel more confident if number four was quarterbacking, but you know that is kind of the X factor in this. I was impressed with how Cooper Rush did last week, but I'm uh, I'm kind of anxiously awaiting this to see what might actually happen. Well, good thing that this so. show took us to like 7:20, so we don't have to wait much longer. That's true. We don't have very long, do we? No. All right. Well, great stuff as always. Thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Again, you know, of course, we're going to be here all week, all next week, all season, for that matter. Jess, great stuff as always. I will talk to you later in the week. 
Sounds good. Thanks. All right. We're going to sign off right now. Hit that like button if you would, if you already haven't, before you take off. And otherwise, we'll talk to you tomorrow on IB Nation Sports Talk.